Hi everyone and welcome back to my top 500 games and we are continuing on with number 473 which is iToy Groove. If you don't know what the iToy was, it was a peripheral that you could get for the PS2, uh, kind of like a predecessor to the Kinect in a way that you put it on top of your TV, it was like a little camera and what happened was you moved your body around and you sort of like you could hit things in these different games by like slapping them with your hands or knocking it with your head or whatever so there was a few games made for I, the iToy like the iToy series and one of them was iToy Groove iToy Groove was basically the music variation I actually didn't have this game my brother got it it had a set of music on and it was sort of like a, it was a rhythm game basically uh, so you had these like circles on the screen and you had to move your hands like hit the circles in time with the beat and like these little things would go out into the circles so you had to like hit them at the right time it was all right it was a it was a it was a bit of fun and it had quite a few music videos on it as well the one i specifically remember it had the song i don't know if it's called boogie night but the song that goes boogie night da, da, da. i don't i'm not gonna sing anymore that that song I, I don't know what it's called or who it's by i had that song on it also had a uh, fat boy slim on as well the praise you song moving on number 472 is battle arena toshinden now i believe this was the first 3d game i ever played i'm not too sure about that but uh, it was i went to my granddad's house uh, who lives quite a bit of a distance away at uh, one time and he had a PS1 I didn't uh, when I got my PS1 he gave me his so I got his PS1 second hand but he had a PS1 uh, I was just called the PlayStation at the time I, I I mostly remember he had a demo disc and I played on the demo disc quite a lot because I was really I was still I was really into games and to me the PlayStation was like brand new amazing technology so I was really really into it playing on this uh, on this PlayStation and seeing all these 3D games and one of the games on the list was Battle Arena Toshinden I played it and I I absolutely loved the music I still do the EG's theme I love that music I thought it was fantastic and Takara has just a way with music like they've done this in another game that I will eventually mention but they have this thing where they have a very particular style of music that's hard to, to hard to explain it kind of has it's kind of like electronic but it's also it's also like very fast very sudden notes so you might have, so have bits where it's like da -da 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 I, I realize I'm not describing it in a way that makes it sound appealing but you, if you hear it you know what type of things I'm talking about it had a very distinct style but I haven't actually talked about the game yet have I yet the game was it was it was it was a it was a fighting game really nothing special about it what stood out to me though apart from it being 3d which at the time was an, an amazing thing was um, how your characters had like superpowers that you could fire out fireballs and you could uh, like four had like, this massive this massive attack which to me was like oh wow that attack is so huge like this massive ball like this fireball blue thing which sort of I thought was amazing and the fact you could get knocked out of the ring and some levels you could f fall off and like you'd have levels that were like in the sky so the person who fell out of the ring died obviously it was it was quite strange to think about that at that time. Like there was one level where it was like just a platform in the sky. Like what what are you gonna do there once you won the fight? You're just gonna have to stay there. But mechanically, it's not that great of a game, really. I remember my friend uh, Thomas actually had this game when he had a PS1 when I didn't, and I actually played it at his house, and I got to experience some more of the characters besides EG4 and Ellis. And I do remember fighting Gaia, like the final boss of the game. I remember hearing about how you could eventually unlock Gaia, but I actually never saw that. And I eventually found out online that you could fight against Sean in the first game, which I, I never knew about. I mean, I really didn't think much of the first game uh, at all, really, uh, in terms of how much content it had. I'll tell you what else was stupid about the first game as well. In the main menu, you have to press select to scroll down through the menu. I, mean, I don't know whose idea that was. <sighs> Moving on, number 471 is Dynasty Warriors 6 Empires. I like the Dynasty Warriors games. The 6 games, not so much. The Empires games, not so much. So to me, this was a Dynasty Warriors with a huge, huge uh, bad side to it. The fact that it was a six, it was in the 6th series and it was an Empires game. Dynasty Warriors, I, I, I love Dynasty Warriors, but the these this 6 Empires, like... 
you, you had to, um, it was one of my first platinum trophies, I remember. I remember you had to, like, get points to unlock uh, certain things which you needed for the platinum, and for some of those things you had to get certain characters to like you, it was just meant trial and error, like, trying stages over and over again, and there was no consistent leveling system in the game, like, you started the game, you, I think you leveled up within each stage, but you didn't level up overall, if you know what I mean, like, like once you finished like that certain that round of taking over that empire, it didn't seem to have didn't really seem to do anything. And it had all these things to do with like shop merchant would turn up and you'd be asked for alliances and stuff and I, I, I really didn't get it. Like I really didn't get that at all. It just it wasn't really my thing, but it was Dynasty Warriors so I played it and it was okay, I I guess. And I realise I'm going through these quite a bit slower than I have done, so I might not be able to fit as many in this video, but I'll see what I can do. And number 470 is an old classic that everyone knows, and that is Frogger. Uh, you play as a frog, you've got to cross the road as different um, vehicles cross, and then you've got to jump onto the logs that take you across, and you've got to land on the lily pads at the end. Is there anything that I can say that you don't know about Frogger? I, I, I think that's pretty much it. Like, don't really have that much nostalgia about this game, so... Uh, I'm just going to leave it there, I guess, and move on to the next game straight away. See, some games I can talk about very quickly, some games I have a lot more to say. It's better than me just dragging it out for the sake of dragging it out, I suppose. Okay, number 469 is Zool 2. But hold on, we've got another clump here, because at number 468 is Zool. I actually remember getting, I remember getting Zool 2 after I got Zool, even though I got them both very early. In, in my life. Uh, they were, I had them both on the Amiga, and I remember uh, with Zool, Zool 2 was more, I suppose, graphically appealing. Like, you could make more out of it. Like, I remember you had levels that looked like, more like things. Uh, like, you had platforms that looked like these weird coloured eggs and stuff. Zool didn't really have that, but Zool, Zool was all about product placement for the most part, because you fought all these enemies who were made out of licorice all sorts, and you had like the Chupa Chups logo all plastered all over it. Strange to think that like, like these these old games that are like sponsored by sweet companies and all that lot. Which I've got another example of that coming up, uh, maybe not soon, but at some point later on in the list. I've got another example of something similar to that, and basically the way that both games played is that you were this character, you could run fast 2D platformer, you could shoot out bullets and you had to destroy these enemies who were often giant, like giant licorice all sorts, and you collected sweets to like get your points, and you needed like so many in order to complete the level, and sometimes you could find like a, like a giant, a giant polo which is worth lots of points. But what's uh, strange, uh, although maybe not strange so much, but I remember it was one of those games where you seemed to move like quite fast and it was quite hard to like aim your jumps and stuff, and you, had, like, you could like bounce on walls. But it was also the spin attack, which I don't remember what the significance of that was. Uh, also, here's another memory for you. Zool, I actually really remember, um, it wasn't uh, like a copied version, it was one of those, like it was like a legitimate copy of the game. And in order to load up the game, you had this like spinny wheel thing that you had to like turn. It would like when you load up the game, it would say line up these pictures and tell and like say what the number is. So you get like this wheel like that came with the game, like in this box, you like turn bits so that there's the different body parts lined up, and it would give you like a number or something. You have to type that in to confirm that you had a legitimate copy of the game. But saying that, when these games got copied, they off they always found a way to bypass that screen, which is strange. To think about, but yeah, that's Zool uh, and Zool 2. Number 467 is Digimon World on the PS1. Now, what stands out to me about this game in particular is that I remember having quite a bit of fun with this game, but the problem I had with this game was that I never had any idea what you were meant to do. Like, I remember you got a Digimon and you had to, you had to take care of them, and you had to like. You know, you had to like look after them. It was it was it was more like a pet simulator type thing than some, say something like Pokemon. But you had to like take care of your Digimon and you had to go through different places and you had to like feed them and you had to scold them if they did something wrong and all of that. And I just remember like I couldn't leave the first day. I, I think I remember it was like a bridge that was broken and I just couldn't get past. I didn't know what to do. So I spent a lot of time in like the training area 
where you could say to them, like, okay, we're going to train speed, and then they'd get off and they'd, like, run around this course, or there'd be this other thing where they've got to sit under a waterfall for a while, and, like, their stats would, the stats would rise, and then fighting was just, like, you saying, like, attack, 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 or something. I, I really didn't understand it, but it was, it was surprising how much I liked it compared to how little I actually knew what I was doing. I seem to recall that if you train the, if you overtrained the Digimon, that they would die and they would come back as something like a new Digimon or something. I don't really, I, I never understood it. It was, it was a strange, strange, strange game. Number four hundred and sixty-six is Jumping Flash. This is actually a game that I also had on the PS One, which I played like I did with Battle Arena Toshinden. At my granddad's house originally. At least I believe I did because I know it came on the same same demo disc. I actually did play it quite significantly. I suppose again, not knowing what I was doing, but I, I did eventually get the game downloaded onto my PSP uh, when you know the old PS1 classics came out. But I had the demo, and the main thing I remember about it was it was in first person. It plays a rabbit, and you can jump really high. And I remember like you jump. And like you'd look down at the floor as you're jumping and you could like double jump or triple jump or quadruple jump maybe, I can't remember, but you could jump really high. And the levels were very vertical and I actually didn't, I actually remember, I don't think I actually completed like the goals, I think I just remembered like walking around and finding, like I think you had to find carrot or something. I don't specifically remember all the goals of the game, but you could find like time stop power ups. And I think there was a boss that you could fight after you completed that level in the demo. So you fought, you did that level, then you beat the boss. But I didn't play too much of it, but I remember I did play it. When I say I played it significantly, what I remember is, what I mean by that is that I played it significantly time-wise in my memory compared to how much I remember actually getting done. Number 465 is Auditorium HD. And... This is a game that I got on PS3, it was like a download game, it was one of those very, I don't know, well, I don't know if it was early or not, I probably wasn't that early really, because I think I got it quite late, but it was quite a minimalistic visually style game, and I, basically what you do is you have like these little waves of music, and you have to like guide them to, to like reach other parts of the level and get them to like hit certain things, like just we just like these objects, you have to like carry around these bubbles and stuff that would guide the the sound waves into different directions but it's like each individual part of the wave was its own like entities so you had to like stop them from splitting too far apart and stuff a strange game again no not too much to say about it because i don't really have like a story or much nostalgia uh associated with it so i'm just going to move on to the next game now number 464 is loco roco this, I actually had, I played a demo of this first, uh, and I think I did, yeah, I did eventually get it on, on PSP, and this was, I think this was one of the very early PSP games. It was one of those silly, you know, like those silly PlayStation things that sort of was a little bit of a mascot, but wasn't really, like, it didn't maintain its mascot status, uh, if you know what I mean. It was like a, like a yellow blob thing that could split up and connect into other yellow blob things. And you had different coloured ones as well for different stages. And you had to, like, use the L and R button to tilt the level so that you could allow them to roll to different areas and sometimes you had to like split them up to make them all go through the, down like these small pipes that they could all fit through and it was you had to like manipulate the level in such a way that you could get these things through the level. I think there was you could get like a few secrets as well throughout the level but I don't really remember all that much. Uh, so yeah I'm just gonna move on from there. Now, number 463 is a game that I talk about negatively rather significantly, and I, I do I do have quite a bit to say about this, because this is a game that I consider to be one of the worst RPGs I've ever played, but I just think it speaks volumes about how much I like RPGs, that even something this bad could get onto my list at number 463 and that game is last rebellion i'm going to have to talk about this game negatively because i really can't think of much positive to say about this despite the fact that it's ahead of these games that i put behind it but relatively speaking to what it is and and what it does and how it presents its mechanics i just i just have to speak negatively of this game uh, 
I think I I should have explained this all in the first video when I was talking about like all the rules and stuff. So, well, if I, if I didn't, I may not have. But if I didn't, basically, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this game negatively now. Last Rebellion is the one of the simplest RPGs. Everything is so bare bones and so simplistic, and yet the mechanics that it introduces, the unique selling points, so to speak, don't add anything to the game. They just make you do more work. Like, and I'm not gonna say grinding because. Well, grinding is involved, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Basically, with Last Rebellion, the leveling system is such that you level up really, really fast if you're underleveled, or really, really slowly if you're overleveled. So, your level is very, very much enforced, and leveling up makes a huge difference. Like, your stats will skyrocket when you level up. And so, when you get to bosses, it's very, very dependent on what your level is, rather than strategy. Uh, and it can be manipulated so easy like I can't beat this boss it's it's so it's too hard I can't do anything you go away fight 10 battles suddenly they're dead easy you you can just mop the floor with them it's just ridiculously easy but the main mechanic that it prides itself over is the idea that you can attack the body parts of an enemy in a different way and that way you can unlock stamps so that you stab the enemy and they and you unlock their weaknesses what happens when you do this is that uh, you will find you will unlock the correct order to attack the body parts. But there's no there's no skill to that. You are just guessing. And all it basically means is that you're you're eventually doing more damage over time. It also has this sealing mechanic where one of the characters has to seal the enemies away once they die so they don't come back to life. That's not too bad I suppose. You've also got this mechanic that gets introduced whereby you get this power that you can unleash once you've got so many points. But but like it's so powerful and all you gotta do is just you just gotta like grind the points up so that you can unleash it and get like a massive amount of damage and you've got like the super bosses at the end of the game which are just so easy like if you if you've got the levels you could just attack them and win and the tutorial battle at the start of the game is is harder than that if you've got the levels there's so much negativity that i can talk about this game and how it does everything wrong and how how you can heal by having your character a certain character out that you're like controlling so to speak and just wait all the time as you heal this, this, I can't really think of anything in particular that that I can say this is a good game but I have the experience and the nostalgia enough about this game that I, I, I'm placing it at number 463 but don't take this as me saying that a game is so bad yet I'm placing it at 463 think of it as I love RPGs to the point where this game is so bad that it only can possibly reach 463, which for an RPG is ridiculously low. That's the best way I can think about it. Um, it's the best way I can describe it. Uh, so yeah, uh, quite a bit to say about Last Rebellion there, but I'm just going to stop there. And I'm going to end this here, so I'll see you next time when we'll continue on from number 462. And I will see you all next time. Bye!